So Ali will just be kind of putting a, an economic twist on some magnetic work. Um, so he's using statistical machine learning to classify hydrothermal alteration. So when you're ready, uh, Ali. Can you see that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Vince. Yeah. As Vince said, I'm Ollie, and I'm a second year uh, in my second year of my PhD, which focuses on the structural controls of porphyry copper deposits. And today I'm going to be presenting a machine learning, a new machine learning algorithm that I've developed mainly with Nasser Mandini in Nasser AI University in Kazakhstan. And this will form my first chapter and hopefully we'll be getting submitted in the next few months. Um, so disclaimer, there's not a lot of magnetic measurements in the first section of this, but I will, I will get there. Um, so first, a little background. With the continued growth in the global population expected to continue for the next century, and our increased appetite for the latest and greatest technological advancements, the continued urbanization in both the developed and undeveloped, uh, underdeveloped nations, and our increasing awareness and move towards renewable energy sources, which all require uh, between 20 and 30 times more copper than conventional energy sources, the society's demand for copper is actually predicted to increase by greater than 300% over the next 50 years. And this just highlights the importance for geologists to develop uh, new methods for discovering deeply buried deposits and change the way of uh, the type of uh, the type and way that data is collected and used to increase mining efficiency in the future. So for those of you that don't really know, the majority of the world's copper population uh, copper comes and other metals come from uh, porphyry copper deposits uh, and they and the very widely accepted current model for formation is one where you have these large bodies of igneous material that evolve over time and in some uh, of the later stages of that evolvement you have the breakthrough of fluids through the roof of the uh, through the roof of these intrusions to form these multi-phase porphyry copper stock works. Uh, and where this, occur, where this occurs, there are three main triggers for mineralization. The first being uh, the cooling and expansion of vapor caused by steep temperature, uh, caused by the steep temperature gradient at the top of these fingers. And that's due to sulfide solubility being uh, temperature and density dependent. The second being the evolution of a fracture network above the deposit which causes rapid pressure drops as hydrofracturing occurs. And the third being the neutralization of the hydrothermal fluids as it interacts with circulating groundwater. So as with all mineral deposits, this fluid flow causes alteration in the surrounding hole, uh, rocks. And the current very widely accepted alteration pattern that occurs is this one by Silto, which was published in 2010. However, both within industry and academia, these alteration zones uh, play a vital role in both the exploration and extraction of the metals. But as until now, uh, this is based entirely on a geologist's eye, which as you can imagine, inherently causes ambiguity because we all see and interpret things completely differently. Um, uh, so the solution that I think, well, I, what I think the solution to this is, is being able to cross-reference quantitative data sets, um, which in this case, I'm using a magnetic susceptibility, but would like to bring in more magnetic data in, into that and hyperspectral data. Um, so due to this being based on quantitative data, then this would be completely repeatable and reproducible. And ultimately actually means that anyone can collect the large quantities of data that would make the outcome more accurate and also give you a better picture of these large multi-billion pound mines that I'm working on. Um, so currently I have only integrated IP and OP magnetic susceptibility into the algorithm that I'll describe in a bit. Um, but as I will demonstrate later, there are significant differences between the groupings that the algorithm identifies um, that 
represent more than just an access data. And I'm totally I'm, and I'm totally wanting to incorporate more characterization, characterization mag data, but currently don't have the data uh, quality, uh, quantity uh, for the method that I'm using here. Um, so for the completeness of this presentation, uh, MAGSUS is defined as the ability of a material to be magnetized in a low AV field, but I'm not gonna dwell on that at all and move on quite quickly. So for those of you that don't know, uh, also hyperspectral, I'm going to also use hyperspectral reflectance, which is a non-destructive technique, which collects and processes information from across the electromagnetic spectrum. And that reflectance, when normalized to a whole envelope, looks something like this. And this is the spectra of a smectite cl clay known as alunite. If I then present uh, those for both montemorillonite and uh, kaolinite as well, and you can begin to see variations in the absorption pattern within the same mineral group, in this case, smectite. From these, we can extract that. From these, we can extract various pieces of information by using different algorithms, which look at for different things and at different parts of the spectrum. So the sort of things that you can get quantitative numbers for is, for example, the composition, which is based off the peak uh, position, which, for example, in this uh, example, you can see the alunite having a peak at 2,115, the um, monte having a peak between 2,020, uh, 2000 and 2205 and 2215 and then also Kayla and I having the same peak uh, at a peak of around 2206. Uh, As and if we then look at those um, peaks we can look at the intensity of that composition that's been identified uh, which tells us uh, the abundance of that mineral present relative to one another. And then also you can look at the crystallinity, which is based off the full wave half, max, uh, half minimum value. So it's basically looking halfway up that peak and looking at the, uh, the, the size of that um, peak. So in the study, I've done this for the major and minor silica and sulfide mineral groups found most regularly in the deposit, which include epidotes, smectites, white micas, amphiboles, carbonates, chlorites, and also sulfides. Uh, meaning that with the IP and OP mag sus data, I have a 29 dimensional data set. Um, and as you can probably appreciate, and imagine this is very hard to visualize and get any useful information out of without doing some sort of uh, statistical, uh, using some sort of statistical method. Um, but what I've done is along with colleagues in Nazarbayev University is come up with this new and novel uh, machine learning algorithm, uh, which looks at all this data and splits it apart into its uh, most representative groups of data. So I'm not going to dwell too much on the math, but here is a quick explanation. So imagine in a high dimensional space, we're going to measure the similarities uh, between points, which is defined as PIJ in this space. And we're going to do that in a way that we just look at the local similarities to that one point. So imagine a point in that data set being XI, and then and we center a gashon over that point, we're going to then measure the density of all the points within this, in this case, uh, on this equation, x i, uh, x j, and then we're going to renormalize all this with the bottom, which is what the bottom part of the uh, fraction on the screen does. So when, you, when we run this for all the points in the data set, we have a set of probabilities of p i j for each, um, data point, 
which measure the similarity between pairs of points in the original high dimensional space. So if the points are close together in high dimensional space, then we'll have a large value of Pij. And if the two points are far apart, uh, then we'll get a Pij, which is basically infinitesimal. So now imagine a two dimensional xy plot, which I'm saying is low dimensional space. And this is what we want the data to be simplified down into and represented in. Uh, and I represent each high dimensional object in this low dimensional map with an arbitrary position point to begin with and repeat the same thing, calculating the procedure, uh, uh, calculating to produce a similarity measure of QIJ in the low dimensional space. And then if we take uh, this kerback liber divergence, we're going to measure, which measures the difference between the PIJ value in high dimensional space and the QIJ values from the low dimensional like space. Um, we want, as iterations of this algorithm take place, we want the kerback liber divergence to become as small as possible with the aim to be be getting it down to zero. Um, but obviously that doesn't always take place, like, and you just have to stop the uh, algorithm when it gets close to zero or flat lines. So currently I have a magnetic susceptibility in a hyperspectral data set that is 5, uh, 5,814 strong with a further 4,000 581 still to measure. Um, obviously this becomes quite computationally expensive to run um, and it takes currently about five days uh, with the current data set. However, so that you can imagine the picture and um, imagine and picture what is going on uh, with the different iterations, I have put together this sort of interactive graph which goes through periodic in uh, iterations up to a total of like 400, um, where you will see the Kerback Liber divergence being stopping at 0.49. But if I let uh, this run fully until the Kerback Liber divergence is actually at point stops at 0 0.03, um, you that's my final uh, outcome which once this is finished, I will show you. Yeah. So that's that finished. And this is the outcome where the colors all represent uh, the 12 different clusters that have been identified. So let us first just concentrate on these, the three green clusters here, which or would all fall into traditional propriolytic alteration zone, as can be seen with these three sample images, which I don't know about you, but I wouldn't necessarily always be able to pick apart or identify them as different things. There are slight differences, but yeah. Um, so now if we first look at some AMS data, then we can see for this purple point down in the bottom left of the graph, the uh, bottom left um, cluster, um, we have unique IP and OP results, which isn't the case in the other two clusters. Um, however, the other two have very different TX results, where you have this group being dominated by magnetite. Uh, but with very little change in mineralogy and heating. And in complete contrast with the upper cluster here, then we have magnetite present, but with the heating forms uh, no new phases. So yeah, that bottom bit, you've got pyrotite forming with another phase. And in the upper one, you've got not much forming. It's almost reproducible. So if we now go back to the full graph and we uh, focus on this blue group, 
which would fall into philic alter into the philic traditional philic alteration zone again which can be seen by these two data points that i've uh, got images for then uh, we can also have distinct ams results as well where this group um, has uh, orange data point has distinct ip and op ams results However, in this red group below, then you don't have distinct IP and OP AMS results. Timing there, Ali. Okay. Um, so now if we go back to the full graph and isolate the orange group again, and this is the uh, argilic and advanced argilic alteration. Again, I'll go through all of these for timing. Uh, but if we look at uh, the TX results here, then we can see that this top one you get the uh, complete uh, uh, you get the complete uh, destruction almost of magnetite, but then no uh, pyrotite forming. But in the bottom one here, you get pyrotite forming from the magnetite that was there originally. And so then go back to this last one, and we focus on this potassic alteration, which actually is different to the others because it's in fact got a very large statistical difference uh, that's been identified between this one and this sample. Um, and then we actually this time look at field dependent AMS. Then we can see the top, top clusters in the minimum and intermediate uh, axes, then it is field dependent in outer phase, but not in phase. Whereas in the in phase and outer phase, for the bottom uh, cluster, then it's neither field dependent in either outer phase or in phase. So what's next with this? So as you can see, I've got a lot more work to do to collect a suite of magnetic characterization data that will allow me to determine the very subtle differences that the algorithm is identifying between the different clusters, and maybe even incorporate some more magnetic statistics into the algorithm. I would also and it would be really cool to be able to identify, um, uh, incorporate textual analysis into the algorithm as well. So the clusters are based off both the rock texture as well as the quantitative mineral data. But let's um, just leave you with the final thought of my end goal here, which is for the usefulness of this method within industry to be fully used to ex help aid in more detailed mine modeling and ultimately more eff efficient extraction process. To achieve this, this, then the collection of the data that I'm using will need to be fully automated and allow for multi, as I said, large multi-billion pound mining projects to collect large uh, quantities of data um, really quickly and easily. Um, are there any questions? And thank you for listening. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, very nice talk again. Thank you. Um, I was kind of, I was wondering to what extent that the addition of the magnetic uh, component to your twenty nine uh, yeah. parameter space makes a difference. I mean, do you have you compared the clustering output that you get with and without the magnetic input? So just based purely on the spectroscopy versus spectroscopy plus the magnetic. I mean, to how how I guess what I'm get, trying to get yeah. at is, is, is how much is your clustering dictated by the, the sort of the, the spectra the spectra. So spectra I've done uh, the sort of spectroscopy. Uh, and how much is additional added value do you get by adding in the magnetism? Yeah. So with the um, with the algorithm, it basically calculates the uh, how much it's been dominated by each of the different um, inputs. And so the okay. outer phase and in phase, you get back, it changes slightly depending on the exact data set that you run and how large that is. But it's on the region of like with in phase and outer phase of about 33 to 40%. So it's quite significant. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I'd like to uh, incorporate more magnetic data because actually then hopefully that would produce more data there to pull apart the differences that are obviously present statistically, but I haven't got the 
current data to sort of do that, if that makes sense. And yeah, wait, I yeah. hope that answer is. Yeah, yeah. no, uh, that answers exactly my question. <laughs> you can actually quantify it, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, Oliver. I, I mean, I've got a, a sort of similar um, uh, a question. So, I mean, yeah. I'm assuming that um, your, your unmixing algorithm is essentially kind of an unsupervised um, algorithm. Yeah. So it's essentially fitting the, the end member spectrum based upon the data that you input. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, have you tried so that there are, you know, catalogs of uh, spectra for a wide range of minerals? Um, because they often will have a, 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 um, a defined um, uh, spectrum for, for the individual minerals. There, there's yeah. some variation there. But have you actually tried doing a, a sort of semi-supervised unmixing where you are using a library of the spectra for uh, uh, the minerals? And then you're using a, essentially trying to find uh, matching um, your data to this library as opposed to, to taking all the information purely from uh the, the the data set yeah yeah so i have tried that and one of the sort of issues there is that obviously you get a spectral measurement for a bulk rock and the mineral libraries are single minerals and therefore you can very easily like identify um minerals that it thinks are present but are clearly not um But like um, going into the future, like it would be, so the, the actual algorithm, that the statistical algorithm to cluster will learn these, as, as more and more and more and more data gets like run through, then it will learn where these clusters are appearing. And um, like that will then form the, beginning part of the new like data that you run through if that makes sense I, yeah, does that yeah. fully answer your question i'm not entirely sure but yeah yeah, 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 good yeah good okay. enough. <laughs>